morning here, good morning in the cafe, good morning online, welcome to church. They're, they're, that song, it's, it's precious, isn't it? And, and it reminds us that we do see now with different eyes, right? The glory of God. Now, if you were with us, see, one of the things that having split services does, it kind of it breaks us up a little bit. And, and, and it's, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a regrettable necessity at the moment. But those of you that were with us down the beach on Sunday, last Sunday after the service, when Jamie Lee and Lucas were baptised, you know, um, the expression of that song was seen vividly. Yeah. When I sat down with young Lucas and I said, so what, what, what are you doing? You know, why, why are we doing this? You know what his response was? Because I want to be, um, I want to be, in, I want to come into the beloved. I want to be a part of the family of God, is what he was saying. You know, and, um, and, and, and when a young, a young child, you know, understands that, embraces that, and, and the excitement of it all, you know, he, 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 there was a lot of giggling and there was a lot of bouncing around, wasn't there? You know, but the core of it was, I want to be in God's family. And he understood, this young boy understood that the way to God's family is through Jesus Christ. And he was baptised with that joy, with that expectancy. And alongside of him, his mother was baptised. And, and, and you know it's real when, and if you were there, you saw this, that when Jamie Lee came out of the water, you know, you might have seen the photo with the, the, the fist pump, right? Have you seen the photo? But what you don't see in the photo is, as as she came out of the water, she was weeping, she was crying, you know. She was overwhelmed with the reality of what had taken place within her heart, what God had done. You know, and I said to her, you know, what, what, we have, what we have just done is symbolic of what God has already done within your heart. And you are now beginning a new walk, a new journey. You walked into this water, you came into this water symbolically as unclean, needing forgiveness of your sin. But as you go down under the water, symbolically it reminds us of the blood of Christ and how we've been washed clean by his righteousness. And now we walk from this water, and this is one of the great privileges of baptising somebody. Because you go out into the water with them, and you can say to them, you are beginning a journey now. And we are walking out of this water as new creations. And God's going to do incredible things. And to be able to walk alongside of them, as Dan did with his sister and his nephew, to walk alongside of them in those very first steps from that water onto that beach, into this world, and who knows what God is going to do. Isn't it amazing? It was great. I keep saying to you, that's why we do what we do. You know, God is always doing good things, isn't he? And our eyes are upon him. That's the most important thing. So how are we? Can you see me? Because I, I can't see you. <laughs> Can we have some lights on, please? Well, let's open our Bibles. Uh, let's go to the book of Habakkuk. We're going to bring this study to an end this morning. If you're a visitor today, we've been in the, the book of Habakkuk. We've been listening to a, a, um, a conversation between the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk and, of course, the Lord. And it's a, it's a, been a conversation that took place 700 years before Jesus was born. And... Um, um, It was a time when the, the nation of Judah, king of Israel, had been split in two. The northern kingdom, known as Israel, had 100 years before this gone into captivity. They had given themselves over to a, a wanton rebellion against God and, and they reaped the, uh, the consequences of rejecting their God and judgment fell. And 100 years before this, they had fallen and now Judah in the south is um, on the verge of the same consequences. They had rebelled against their God. They'd given themselves over to idolatry. And when you turn away from God and you begin to worship other things, it's, it's the, 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 the reality is the things that you begin to worship become the things that consume you and become the things that destroy you, the things that are not of God. And that's what was happening. And, 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 and Habakkuk, this, this prophet of God, has been looking around and he's seeing... This nation that he loves, these people that he loves, and he's seeing them 
walk in, in this, this rebellious wickedness against their God and there is great injustice. There's violence amongst the people. They are so far from the people that God had called them to be and he's looking at this and he's crying out to God not knowing, not understanding, saying, why, Lord? Why is this happening? Why aren't you doing something about it? The perennial question, right? When we see wickedness in the world and we don't understand it so often we find ourselves like Habakkuk saying, I don't, why won't you do something, Lord? Why won't you? And of course the Lord spoke to him. <laughs> Excuse me, the Lord spoke to his heart and told him that he was doing something. And he caused his gaze to look upon the horizon to see a rising nation, an invading force, a very wicked people, a people even more wicked than, the, the, than, 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 the, the, than Judah themselves. And God says, see that nation, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, and he described them. He described the brutality of them. And, and he said, I'm raising them up and I'm bringing them in to bring judgment against my people. And of course now the prophet is just lost, right? He doesn't understand it at all. Before, he didn't know why God was moving. Now he knows what God is doing. He's completely perplexed. I don't get this, God. They are more wicked than us, and you're going to use them to bring judgment to us? Why, God? And of course, not knowing what God is doing or understanding why God is doing it, the one thing that he did, and we've seen this repeatedly, is that he turned to the truth that he knows about God. And he, and he cries out to God and he says, but God, you, excuse me, you are from everlasting. You are holy. Lord, you, 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 won't, you won't gaze, you won't even look upon unrighteousness. This is who you are. I know this is who you are. I don't understand this, but I know this is who you are. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go into my high tower. I'm not going to look upon the trouble that's coming. I'm not going to look upon the trouble that's right here amongst us. I'm going to watch you. I'm going to watch you. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to hear what you are going to say to me when I am corrected. See, this is his position. This is why I love this man, Habakkuk. Because while he doesn't understand what God is doing, he knows who God is. And that's the most important thing to him. He knows who God is and he understands that when he is in conflict with what he sees and what he knows God is, he knows that the problem is not God because God is holy. God is pure. The problem has got to be me. And so I'm going to wait. And that's what he did, right? And the Lord told him to write some things down. And he began, the Lord began to describe to him this coming invasion. But he said those words, didn't he? He said, he who is prideful, he's, who lifts up his heart as... Oh. <laughs> those that lift themselves up in pride, he says, are not upright, but the just shall live by faith, he says. <coughs> the just shall live by faith and... And then God begins to give him a contrast to what real faith is. He describes the wickedness of the Babylonians. And and that's kind of where we were last week. And so that second chapter um, uh, brings this very confronting reality using the the ancient Babylonians as an example. And and this is a confronting reality that we that we that we, we find ourselves last week in the second chapter, and that is that all will face the consequences of their choices. Isn't that right? It's, it's true of me, it's, it's true of you. It's true of nations, it's true of empires. And again, highlighted in that chapter was, was the greed. Remember this last week? It was the greed, it was the injustice, it was the violence. It was the seduction that marked that ancient Babylonian empire. And, and, and then the first chapter, if you remember from a couple of weeks before that, they were, they, were, they were ascribing their violent conquest because they were a nation. That's what they did. They, they lived to conquer, to conquer more. You know? and, and in the first chapter, describing their violent conquest to the worship of their God, they worshipped greed, they worshipped injustice, they worshipped violence. And what we realise is that these are characteristics uh, that, that identify, that always have identified the gods of a world that have rejected the true and the living God, and worship other things. See, the question always has been this. And stop me if I digress too much, will you? But the question has always been this. What What is it that drives a person's passions? What is it that controls them? It's the question because 
it's the question that needs to be answered because whatever the answer to that is, what drives a person's passions, what controls them, that is what receives their worship. As, 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 I, no, as the psalmist said in Psalm 115, that's what receives their worship, that becomes their God, and the psalmist tells us they become like the God that they worship. Their violence, their greed, their seduction, they worship those things. As a, seeing themselves as this great nation conquering all before them, it not only defined them, but it shaped them. It's what they became. So this is what God is doing in this book. He's exposing the lustful greed for violent conquest of these Babylonians. And in so doing, highlighting the futility of rejecting him, again, for the worship of another. And at the same time, if you've been with us, you see he's been answering Habakkuk's questioning mind about why these things are happening. It's pretty simple. It really is. The way that you live and treat others will ultimately decide your own fate. This is the light. This is what Habakkuk's questioning heart reveals to us. In other words, you, you cannot ignore, you cannot pretend he isn't there. Right? God is there. You cannot do as you please and rebel against a holy God without inviting his judgment upon you. This is what Habakkuk is learning. It happened to the Babylonians. Their greed, again, their injustice, their violence, their, their seduction, it consumed them. And again, this is God's message to Habakkuk. This is the answer to his question. Why? What are you doing, God? But, but remember verse 20? But the Lord, it says, is in his holy temple. So therefore, let all of the earth be silent before him. So this is it. Habakkuk, you question my methods. You question what I'm doing. You thought that everything was out of control. This is God speaking to Habakkuk. You thought everything was out of control. Hey, you need to know something. I know what I'm doing. I am on the throne. I am in control. And he's saying to Habakkuk, and he says this to each and every one of us, you don't have to know all the whys and all the hows of what I'm doing. Because again, referring back to the Babylonians as an example, he says, but those that have lifted themselves up in pride, they are not upright within themselves, but the just. They live by faith. Mm. See, this is the secret of getting through the darkest of days. Mm. It really is. Just know this, that God is working, always has been working, always will be working, and the unjust that rise up against God's work... <laughs> they will experience the inevitability of their own sin coming down upon them. I described it to you last week like a massive swell, a wave building up behind them. That they were taking pride in and glory in this magnificent wave that they are riding. It's going to come down upon them and crush them. That's what God is saying. God is saying to the Habakkuk, I've got it covered. You've got to trust me here. Again, the ancient Babylonians, they believed that they were building an empire that was going to last forever. Remember how long it lasted? Less than a century. It was replaced by the Medes and the Persians. They came and they went. They were replaced by the Grecian Empire. They came and they went. They were replaced by the Roman Empire. They came and they went. And God is saying here, but my kingdom will remain forever. He says the whole of the earth, and this is, this is the hope of glory within the child of God. The whole of the earth, he says, but it will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Again, I asked you week in and week out, have you seen any ancient Babylonians lately? No, you haven't. But the kingdom of God goes on, doesn't it? And the earth will be filled. That's what you need to know, Habakkuk. I'm doing something. I'm doing something bigger than you can even begin to imagine. You look around this world and there's much wickedness and there's much unrighteousness, there's violence, there's injustice. You don't get it. But what I am doing is going to cover the entire world with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Wait, Habakkuk. Be patient, Habakkuk. And the same message to us, isn't it? And we understand this as believers. We, we just simply, we've got to be still. We've got to stop this raging. We've got to stop this struggling against what God is doing in this world. And we've got to be still. 
like, 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 like the psalmist says, and know that he is God, right? And know that he has his hands upon the wheel. We're so much like backseat drivers, aren't we? Trying to control the direction of the car, right? No, no, God says, take your hands off the wheel and know that I am God. I'll show you. I'll show you. Know that he is God. That know that he is in his temple. You'd believe that, don't you? That God sits upon the throne. But not only that he sits upon the throne, but that he is a holy God. He's a holy God. So let's just be silent before him. Let us bow ourselves before the Lord of heaven, who alone can fulfill all the deepest longings of our heart and our souls. This is where Habakkuk is right now. He's come away, hasn't he? If you've been with us over these weeks. Before we move on, we'll get there. Before we move on, I want to point out one of the most wonderful things about this, this prophet Habakkuk. I don't know if you've noticed it. He is always, always coming to the Lord. Have you noticed that? Like I said in the very beginning of this study, I, thought, I think Habakkuk's always had a raw deal. He's been seen as a complainer and a whinger and, and, and all of this. But I say, who of us isn't? Right? He's always coming to the Lord. I want you to know that about him. I want you to see that in him. At the very beginning, yeah, he was complaining. He was saying, I don't understand it, God. But where was he when he said that? He was before the throne of grace, wasn't he? That's where he was. And when God answered him, he still didn't understand. He became more and more perplexed. Now he's upset. Now he's confused before God. Where does he go? Where does he go? He goes to his high tower, doesn't he? He sits. He waits. He's before the Lord. He's always coming to God. I want you to see that. It's important to note that nothing really has changed, right, on the outside as far as Habakkuk is concerned. Concerned. <laughs> Good word. Write it down. Concerned. <laughs> Nothing's changed on the outside. The people of God are still far from where they should be. The Babylonians are still on the horizon. They're coming, right? They're coming. They are. But by always coming to God, you know, with, hey, with his complaints, by always coming to God with his confusion, by always coming to God and listening to what God is going to say and still not understanding, right? But always coming to God, waiting and trusting in who you know God really is. In this, God was able to work not necessarily on the outside, even though God will, but firstly and primarily, God was working on the inside of this troubled prophet, bringing peace in the confidence and confidence in the midst of a very dark time. If there is anything that you should hold up from this man's life, it's that. He could have run in so many different directions, couldn't he? He could have run so many different places in the face of his inability to deal with the things that he sees happening around him. And, and, and they just are, right? There's so many places that troubled minds find themselves. The first port of call for so many people is anger, right? Just We don't get it, so we rage in anger, right? Or, or if we're not raging in, in anger, we're festering in the disappointment of how life is turning out for us. And if that's taken, no, if, if that's taken place, then, then we find ourselves, you know, just numbing ourselves or trying to numb ourselves to the reality of what we just can't grasp. And so many people find themselves numbing themselves by all different substances and all different sorts of abuses, or they drown their fears in, in, in the bottle, or, or they just start striking out with venom and, 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 and words of, again, of anger, where you can cut yourself from, off from the complete reality of everything and just start, start, you just start, just start consuming yourself with things and, and, and whatever this world can bring you, right? Or you can just try and blot it all out with some hedonistic, self-indulgent life. There are so many places, so many places that you can run to when things get uncertain, not have a cuck. This is why he is so for today. He has but one direction. You know that? He has but one direction. It doesn't matter what his starting point is. And that's just as important to notice. Whether it be confusion or doubt or fear, it doesn't matter what the starting point is. He is always moving himself towards... God from that point. So I don't know where you are today. I don't know what your starting point is right now. 
But what Habakkuk says to us reminds us the only direction that we should be moving towards is towards God. What Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Again, the writer of Hebrews would say earlier in the fourth chapter in verse 16, let us therefore, we know this verse, right? Let us therefore boldly come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in this time of need. If we like Habakkuk, I'm taking too much time here, I know, but if we like Habakkuk, in our often perplexed minds about life would likewise be always moving towards God. I, I, I don't get it, Lord, but here I come, right? Uh, it, it doesn't seem right to me, Lord, but I know I'm safe with you. And so here, here I come. It's always here, here I come. If we like Habakkuk are always seeking God, I believe that we will find comfort in his presence. I know that to be true. And like Habakkuk, in this third chapter, we're going to be found in that place of worship. Because that's what's happened in this man's life. The outward hasn't necessarily changed, but the inward has changed so dramatically. Always moving towards God. Always trusting what you know to be true about him. Listening opening your hearts, becoming full of praise and adoration towards your king. I say this because, oh, here we are, third chapter, finally got there. Begins by saying, you want to, would you want to start now? Begins by saying, look at the first, first verse, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shiganoth. Who knows what Shiganoth means? If you do, you know better than anybody else. Shiganoth is the plural word of the singular word, you got this, that is used in Psalm chapter 7. When David, introducing a psalm, says the Shiganon of David, which he sang to the Lord. It's, it's an untranslated word. That's why I said we, we don't really know what it is. But what most people agree is that here it is a reference to the words of this prayer. Notice what it says, a prayer of Habakkuk. But it's, it's a reference to the words of this prayer being set to music. But it could also be a reference to, the, to an accompanying instrument. We don't know. It could be the song's meter. It could be the musical setting. It could be the tone. We don't actually know. But most commentators are going to agree on the fact that this word shiganoff carries with the idea of a strong emotion. So this prayer is composed as an impassioned song. That's my best understanding of it. So... so Shall we read this impassioned <laughs> song, this prayer? Yes. Okay. O Lord, I have heard your speech and I was afraid. Verse 2. Did I read verse 1? I did. Revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Selah, think upon these things, is what that means. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the lights. He had he always flashing from his hands, and there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence, and forever followed at his feet. He stood and he measured the earth. He looked and, star and, he looked and startled the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtain of the land of Midian trembled. O oh Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea? That you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Your, your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the waters passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitations at the light of your arrows they went at the shining of your glistening spear. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for your salvation of your people, for salvation of your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare the foundation to neck. You thrust through with his own arrows the head of the villages. 
They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. They rejoiced like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses through the heaps of great waters. Now, look, you didn't get all that, did you? <laughs> I, I, I encourage you to spend some time there. Because this, I, very briefly, this impassioned prayer, this song, this cry from this prophet's heart, what he seems to be doing is remembering God's repeated deliverance of his people from Egypt to the promised land, more specifically, <coughs> excuse me, from oh, excuse me, from Sinai to Canaan. Could be from earlier. As you understand, as you get into it, you could find references that apply to things that happened um, prior to Sinai. But it, what it is, what it is, it's full of the stories of the amazing things that God has done in the past. It's full of His miracles. It's all about God's great power and glory to deliver his people. And what Habakkuk is saying in this impassioned prayer is, I remember all those things, God. I, I know what you have done. He's saying, this is who I know you to be. You are the Holy One. You revealed your glory and your power. You guided your people by fire and by, <coughs> me, and by cloud. It says that you measured the earth. In other words, God, you know exactly what it requires to be able to bring your judgment upon this rebelling world. You know what is needed. You parted the waters and we, apply, you know, looking back to the forefathers, the Hebrew people, we walked across on dry land. You shook the earth, the walls come tumbling down. Do you know stories that match that? You used torrential rain, turning the enemy's battlefields into indefensible swamps. Do you know a story from the Old Testament that applies to that? You stopped the sun and the moon from moving, that the battle might be won over the Valley of Angelon. Do you know that story? It's all there, isn't it? He says, God, you used pestilence, you used plague, you marched through Canaan to deliver your people to the inheritance, the promise that you made to them. You did all these things for us, Lord. All of it. So Habakkuk is passionately crying out to God, I know who you are. I, I know who you are. You revealed yourself in the creation. You revealed yourself in our history. You have power to command the land, the sea, the heavens and the earth. I know it. I know what you have done in the past. He's saying, Lord, I know who you are. I know what you've done. And Lord, I want you to do it again. I want you to do it again. What does it say in verse 2? Oh, Lord. I have heard your speech and I was afraid. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. But in wrath, Lord, please remember mercy. This is a great man of God. He knows the power of God to deliver his people. And he is in awe of that power. It's undeniable. But he also knows what God has told him. He knows what God is going to do to save them from themselves, from their own self-destruction. And that terrifies him. That's why he says, I've heard your speech and I was afraid. But God, but God, do what you have to do. Have you ever prayed that prayer in your own life? Do what you have to do. Do it again in our time, Lord, but in wrath. In wrath, please remember mercy. You see, what he knows, and we know this, what he knows is that God's anger against their sinfulness was justified. And so it is with tears. Do what you have to do, God. But show us that same mercy that you always have done. That history has revealed over and over again. Habakkuk is asking for revival knowing that judgment will precede it. He knows that. And I read this and... Uh, I've got to pause here. I really do. Because this really is an arresting passage. It, it, it really is. Because I know there are many here in this room that long for revival, right? 
that, that, that the church of God, that the people of God would be revived. That the Lord would, would, would awaken us from our spiritual slumber. We, we would, along with Habakkuk, be praying, Lord, oh Lord, revive your work. Revive your work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, make it known. Do it now, God. We would do that, wouldn't we? But here's my question. When I look at this man, and I look at the desire of this church, not this church, but the church of this world in which we live, my question is, do we really seek it with tears? Do we really seek it with tears? Or have we become... And I was going to say, forgive me for asking this, but no. It needs to be asked. Have we become too familiar with the things of God? So familiar so familiar and I'm afraid of this actually so familiar I'm afraid that we no longer hold the things of God as sacred you know what I'm talking about I'm talking about the glory of God I'm talking about the holiness of God in God's people I am afraid that we have become so familiar that we no longer hold to them as sacred I'm afraid that we no longer meditate upon the glory and the holiness of God when we choose and do what we do in this world. I think we've lost, quite frankly, the call to be different, to be different in this world. What are you called to be? Light, right? You're called to be salt, right? That has flavour. We should be identified, and I, read, I say this over and over again, we should be identified by the love of Christ within us one for another. That's who we should be. But there is this increasing view of love in the world that really has nothing to do with the love of Christ in his people. You know that? It seems that the love that so many people are accepting these days is a love that is just that. It's accepting of any and all behaviours and lifestyles without question. And to lovingly call a person to repentance... Well, that's just called being judgmental and bigoted, isn't it? It, it, it? So we don't speak. So we don't speak, even when we know that the sin that is capturing that person's life is going to destroy them. It's going to bring destruction. Why? Well, because love just doesn't do that. No, 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 no. We need to be reminded that he's holy. That God is holy. You see, I say this because I truly believe that if, if, we, if we laid a hold of the holiness of God, if the holiness of God was the most important thing that mattered when I made decisions about my life and what I'm going to do, then I believe that our prayers for revival will take on a fearful desperation. Just like we see in this prophet. Pleading with God to do what he has to do to save us from our own self-destruction. Pleading with him. Why? Because God's done it before. This is Habakkuk's position. God's done it before. And that God is holy. And if that's who we are, then we would not rest with praying for revival, with brokenness in our heart until the fire falls from heaven and God does what only God can do. So what does Habakkuk do? He looks back and he remembers the great power and the glory of God's faithfulness. Can you hold that thought? Can you keep that thought? Because I haven't actually got to my message this morning. We were going to look at the most precious example of faith. Just read it with me. We'll come back to it next week. He said in verse 16, when I heard my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. Your Bible might say that I might wait patiently when he comes to his people and he will invade them with his troops. How does he find that rest in the most desperate of times, the most desperate of places? Well, though the fig tree may not blossom, you're going to have to be here next week for this, all right? That the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be in the vine, 
or the labour of the olive may fail, and the field yield no food, or the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Hey, you might lose absolutely everything. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make. This is the important thing. If this is who God is to us, then he will do it. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on high hills. So this morning, can you look back? Will you look back and be honest? You go back and see what God has done. So you might say, well, that's what God has done in his people back then. But you've got to know, that's the same God that you serve today. The God who did stop the sun and the moon in the, over the valley of Agilon, that the victory would come. The God who did part the waters of the Red Sea, that they might walk across on dry land into the promises of God. This is the same God. So in tears, though you fear what God has to do, no one's welcoming it. This is a completely different understanding of faith to what the modern Western church holds up as faith. Completely different understanding. It's probably good we stop here. We'll talk about this next week. Amen? God bless you. Let's worship this God who has never failed us, who has never abandoned us, who will always be there. Who's been a Christian for more than 10 years? More than 15 years? More than 20 years. 25? Do I dare to keep going? Yeah. 30? Put your hand down when, when you weren't a Christian. 31? 35? 32? 30? 60? No. 40? Oh, this is brilliant. 41? 45? More than 45 years? More than... I'm going to stop this. <laughs> for you who have known God for so long, for you who have so many yesterdays, would you tell those of us who have only known for the Lord for a short time that he's never let you down, that he's never abandoned you, that he's always come through? Would you do that? Because that's what Habakkuk tells us. Amen? Let's worship this great God. Amen. Let's worship.